icons of television on the TV Guide covers you've got behind you? Yeah, well, uh, I have about a couple of thousand uh, in my guest bedroom too, so uh, these are just a few that I had uh, framed. I've got one here. Oh yeah, I see, okay. You know those folks. Yes. <laughs> well, Gareth Neem, uh, Downton Abbey is, uh, you're, you're, I think, right at the tail end of wrapping up production on this series. Tell us kind of where you are right now. What, what, uh, what episode number are you shooting? Well, we're, we're shooting episodes um, seven and eight of the sixth season. So we have, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely in the tail end, but we've got the big finale still to do. When I talked to Julian a couple of weeks ago, he said he still had not written the finale. Is that, is that in, in everybody's hands now? Well, a little bit of hyperbole. I mean, he, he has been working on it for a while, and we have a draft. But um, uh, you know, we're, we're we're still very much uh, you know still under under it's, it's underway, and it's certainly under wraps. We haven't shown it to the actors yet. Oh, okay. Still, still internal at this point. Yeah. Tell us um, now. Um, Whenever you wrap up anything in life, whether it's a job or whether it's a relationship or you're moving to a new city or whatever, it could be lots of emotions going on. What, what's the feeling right now from, from everybody? Well, I think it's only just beginning to dawn on people that, that the end is nigh. I don't think it's going to really sink in until we shoot each actor's final scene or we, for example, shoot the last scene at Highclere Castle or at Evening Studios where we do a lot of our sets. So I think, you know, the... And I think as you applaud off each uh, each character as they do their last scene, I think that would be quite moving. Going back to the beginning, I was wondering, you know, sometimes parts are easy to cast and sometimes it takes you a little bit of a search. What was the hardest one uh, as you all were putting this together? I don't remember a, a hard uh, part to cast. And, and in fact, I've been on record before as saying that the, the first season of this show went so smoothly that I was certain it was going to be a flop. It was just, it just was too harmonious and straightforward. Um, the casting process on the show was about making straight offers to very, very well-known actors, be that Maggie Smith and, and uh, Penelope Wilton and Hugh Bonneville and actors who are uh, well-known. Um, and our casting director, Jill Trevelick, searching for people really at the very beginning of their career. L Laura Carmichael, who plays Lady Edith, uh, which is one of the characters we've most seen evolve over these six seasons. Um, uh, it, this was her first job. You know, she had trained as an actress, but she was working in a doctor's office at the time that we made the offer to her. Um, and Lily James, pretty much the first thing that Lily has done. Um, uh, Sophie McShearer is another one. That, so there, there, there were junior actors at the beginning of their career who we had to audition and very senior actors who we made straight offers to and it all came together um, very, very comfortably. I think you can't, for me when I watch the show and we're working on it, I don't really see a tremendous difference between, you know, I think it works very organically the way that the likes of Dame Maggie Smith, one of the most respected actors in, in the world, um, alongside somebody who's really at the beginning of their career. I think it's, it's in, it seems to me to be quite seamless. When you do have those newcomers, and I'm thinking of like a Lily James who's, you know, burst on the movie scene this year. Is it kind of like, are you kind of like a, a proud father when you see all of your folks going off to other, other projects and doing well? Uh, it's very satisfying, and, and uh, particularly little Lily James in Cinderella, but actually Sophie McShearer, of course, uh, played alongside her as one of the uh, ugly sisters. Uh, I was looking at a clip um, uh, where she gets in get where where Lily's character um, it, Rose is engaged um, uh, in season five, and just looking at that scene and how beautifully she did it. Um, having subsequently seen Cinderella, I could see why she made such a great Cinderella. Uh, it's just all there in, in our show. You know, you've got a great cast as we've all seen all these years, and. I'm wondering because they were, you know, some of them were at the SAG Awards the past couple of times when they won, but you, you know, you were on stage. What were your, what was your reaction to seeing them win the best ensemble, best TV drama ensemble at SAG Awards twice? Yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled by that. I'm the producer of, a, of a, essentially a foreign show. Uh, no foreign show has ever uh, won in that category. Um, you know, that is the most prestigious award, apart from perhaps the sole actor and sole actress. That is the prestigious award. And 
I'm not saying Downton Abbey is the best show on television. Uh, maybe it is, but I tell you what, it's the best ensemble show on television, and that's why our cast, having won that award uh, for twice now, I think is so well deserved. When you think that um, very few of those actors were known to TV Academy voters and to Guild voters at the time that um, the, the show first uh, hit American t uh, television screens. These actors have become very well known now, and and I think people aren't being our cast aren't winning awards or being nominated because of a of a of a long term respect or an affinity for them. But perhaps with the sole exception of of Maggie, uh, largely this is just actors that American Academy members have come to know and respect them in this show, and I, and I think there's no no finer way to be nominated or to win an award. I've enjoyed Dame Maggie Smith for decades. What what is she like off uh, when she's not uh, on camera? Well, uh, when she's not on camera, she uh, tends to go home. <laughs> and what she does, <laughs> but you know, she's. Uh, I mean, I think we all feel that you know it, it is a privilege to work with with people who have these careers that we've just grown up. And you know, Maggie Smith is one of those actresses for whom. You know, there's a body of work that is inspirational when you decide to work in this business. And you, I mean, my connection with her is unusual because my late grandfather directed the prime of Miss Jean Brodie. That was her first uh, Oscar win. And, and if you look back at that film, you know, that is, that is, uh, you just see this is somebody who, well, we, if you look back at it now, you see somebody who we know has had an amazing uh, 40, 50 career, uh, career since then. But it's, it's all in that performance. That's an extraordinary performance. And all the things that we grew up watching her do, and I went to school with her sons, as it happened. So I've been sort of connected um, with, with Maggie and her family for most of my life. And to work with her in this role, you know, she said, I've, I've described her before as being a, almost like a muse to Julian Fellows. There's such a, a synchronicity in in what he writes and, and and how she performs it without as he said before without any degree of sentimentality and he and she in the way that Julian's writing is so deft the way that it goes from something that's melodramatic or moving to some to a laugh out loud funny gag I think Maggie Smith's uh, performance uh, just it's just a delicious interpretation of what Julian's writing Going back to the very beginning, what, how, I, I know I've heard you talk about this before, but maybe not in the context I'm about to ask, how did it get started? I mean, what, what was the, the initial kernel there that, that made you want to do it? Well, I think I, I first admired Julian's work um, when I watched Gosford Park, and I thought that that was such, I didn't know him at the time, um, I went to a screening at BAFTA in London, and I was very impressed by the way that that way of life had been depicted. And um, I didn't meet him until a few years later, um, and we started talking about uh, things we might do together. Um, and then, uh, you know, eventually, I I, proposed, I said to him, "Look, could I ever persuade you to go back to that territory and and uh, create a, a television, an episodic television series, but in that world?" Um, and, you know, I've talked about this many times before, so if anyone who's listening has heard it, I, I'm not going to bore everyone by going over all the old ground, but I think he was a little reluctant to go back to that territory. Um, but um, uh, I left the, uh, the meeting not really knowing what was going to happen, and, and about two or three weeks later, I received an email from him, uh, and he'd set out most of the characters that came to be in the show. Um, so I think he was taken with the idea, and... Um, you know, we pitched it to ITV in, in the UK, which is uh, not the network that you might expect to find this show, because we really did have an ambition to reinvent this genre. You know, it's a very, uh, um, it, you know, it's a perennial favorite for British audiences, but it's tended to be done in quite a, um, you know, conservative way. Costume drama is usually been, you know, uh, literary and, and from adaptations of books. And what we wanted to do was a very modern show that was fast paced with lots of characters, albeit in a setting, you know, 80, 90 years ago. So we were actually breaking new ground and um, received support for it, you know, right from day one. So that's why, as I was saying earlier on, making the first season was pretty straightforward, actually. Everyone got the idea and backed the vision that we had from the show from the beginning. And because we've made every episode 
since uh, that vision I think has been uh, hasn't been you know challenged or, or, or kind of mucked around with um, uh, since then you know, Julian is able to write what he wants to write when you first got to the Emmy Awards after that first season aired here in America uh, did extremely well I was in the miniseries categories the uh, the first time around because it wasn't I think when they when you were doing all the paperwork, it still wasn't set yet that it was a second season. Yeah. Um, but anyway, what what were your expectations as you all got there that night? What what were you thinking? What were you? I know what you were hoping, but what what were you thinking was going to happen? Well, uh, it was a it was a strange one, really. I mean, we have a, a huge amount to be grateful uh, to um, the TV Academy. We sent out screeners. Um, that was a considerable financial investment, actually, for a show on public television with a, a much smaller budget than, than many of the other shows in contention. Um, and the big show, a uh, big miniseries in the year uh, that we won, of course, was uh, Mildred Pierce, uh, you know, brilliant Kate Winslet um, uh, a piece on HBO. And that was really what everyone was predicting to win. But um, we, when we were running the campaign, we were aware that there was, there was quite low level of awareness in the United States for our show. You know, it was on public television, not really a, a, a massive destination of choice for mainstream drama. Um, and it's the members of the TV Academy who watch the screeners, who spread by, you know, the word of mouth. It was people like you, um, who, you know, who watched it and saw it was offering something fresh and different and hopefully very well made. And it was, yeah, it was TV commentators and journalists and voting members of the TV Academy. And we won a plethora of awards the first year in the miniseries category. When we came, so that was what August, I think, in 2011, August 2011. Um, when we came back in the January for the Golden Globes, it was really interesting the difference that everyone by this point seemed to know the show. Uh, and um, of course, now it's it's hard to realize that there was a time where the show had quite a low level of uh, uh, recognition uh, because it it was a sort of slow burn and audiences increased across the first three years to, to making it one of the highest rates shows in America. I, you know, it's funny. I remember getting that screener that early that summer and I, we get, there's so many, so much television as you well know now, I mean, several hundred channels and, 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 and you know, as somebody was telling me yesterday and I totally agree is it feels like the golden age of television with, with the, just the, the wide variety and the quality. But I remember getting that screener thinking, Oh, I meant to watch this a few months ago. And uh, I'll give you the, the best compliment I can when I, when I'm watching a show, at least if I can't wait to watch the next episode, if I watch a whole series, like in a weekend, that, that to me is a high compliment because sometimes you get a show and it's just like, I, I, you don't you you hardly even want to move on to the next episode. But anyway, uh, I think a lot of people here felt that way when they sat down to watch it. Like, oh, I meant to watch this, and and then they couldn't get enough of it. Well, that's great, isn't it? And uh, there's you know there's plenty of other shows which are slower burns like that that people come to a little bit later, and it's actually quite a good way of doing business because people have to pay to catch up. I mean, most people like your good self don't get, get given free screeners, so it's actually quite a good in, uh, business model when people have to catch up. Uh, but we were delighted that, that so many, uh, not only industry people, um, but um, you know mainstream TV audiences. Um, you know, caught up with the show and, and it became just such a, a, you know, a cherished thing. I mean, the support from the United States of the show is really, really overwhelming. And I know it means, it means a tremendous amount to all of the actors and the, and the producers, um, all of the cast and crew. It, it really does. And particularly as we come into the, the, the final year, um, we don't take these things at all for granted. And this summer, you're on the Emmy ballot, obviously, for this most recent season, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed. In fact, I told people I thought this might have been the best season. I, I was really excited about the storylines that were offered and things just moved along at such a fast pace. Tell me um, maybe just a, a particular plot or storyline that you were just really thrilled the way it turned out this, from this past season. Well, well, I think we, you know, a lot of focus would go on to the Edith story. You know, this this is uh, the ugly duckling, ugly duckling from season one. You know, the the also ran of the three sisters. Um, you know, by season five, this is a woman who is on fire. This is a woman who's becoming a professional woman. She's had talk about learning from the school of hard knocks. Everything has gone wrong for this young woman, and yet she keeps plowing on. 
And I think the storyline of, you know, she tries to make arrangements to, for the good of Marigold and for the good of her and her family, she makes uh, certain arrangements which, which don't really work. And eventually she knows, that, you know, that the, the, the strength of, of a mother's love for her child is what uh, takes over. And I just think the way that Edith um, takes back her own child is, a, is a, a really important and very moving story, I thought, beautifully acted. Another one uh, that means a lot to me, um, and I just think is you know, evidence of the sophistication of Julian's uh, writing, is you know, the wonderful storyline where, where Mary decides to, um, to, to test out Tony Gilliam. You know, she has a test drive with him um, in, in, a, in a hotel, and they have this uh, illicit assignment. You know, I, I like the fact that we're depicting that for Mary forming a second relationship as, as, as an older woman, as a woman who's now into her 30s, um, as many people will know, forming a second marriage, a second relationship when you're older is much more complicated than the ease with which you can fall into an early relationship. And I like the way that we've depicted that. But specifically, it's the way that Violet's um, very bitchy butler uh, discovers the truth and spills the beans and Violet finds out that her daughter, her, her granddaughter has disgraced herself by an, an illicit assignation with a man she's not married to. And at the very point that's all coming out and that Violet, Violet challenges Mary about that, of course it's exactly the same time that we're finding out about Violet's past and the fact that she nearly left her husband all those decades ago for this Russian prince. And I think the way those two stories dovetail together just made that uh, really delicious. The idea that season five not only has a lot of present concerns like Edith's uh, child, but also it's the secrets that we have you know, in our past. It's the, the thing, you know, it's, it's the way that Mary and Violet are connected and they're more like each other than they are unlike each other. Yeah, and on the uh, Edith storyline, you know, ultimately when her mother finds out, played by Elizabeth McGovern, I think we kind of pretty much expected that sort of reaction. I mean, she was going to not like it, but she was going to come on board with it pretty fast. I don't think we expected Robert uh, to be as okay. I, I guess that was at the very, very tail end when he sort of figures it out. But I love the fact that even back, you know, 80, 90 years ago, that even though almost any other male in the world would not have had that reaction. He, he was, he was, he was resigned to it. Yeah. There, there's a very strong, uh, air of pragmatism in Robert. I think, although he's a traditionalist and he's a custodian of something from the past that he has to keep going, he's pragmatic, I think. And I also think enough bad things have happened things that would have probably given Robert Grantham a heart attack in the first season. But, you know, let's not forget by this point, you know, uh, you know, Mary's husband has been killed. Sybil has run off with one of his employees and eloped. And, you know, so many things have happened to this family that, that have um, made him have to accept the modern world, albeit perhaps unwillingly. Um, and he already knew earlier on uh, a few seasons ago that the idea of Mary marrying Sir Richard Carlyle because he was the right sort of figure, but she wasn't in love with him. Um, you know, that's he knew that that was the wrong thing, and I think you know he gave Mary similar sort of advice then. And the, the lovely line that Hugh Bonneville uh, often uh, talks about because he really enjoyed the scene where he he says to Mary, you know, go off to go off to America, go to the Wild West, and marry a cowboy. Um, and and there's a, and I think by the time that Edith delivers yet another you know, you know, to bombshell to him um, in season five. I think he just wants her happiness and he accepts the situation as it is and he knows it's not ideal. And it, um, uh, But the child happened because she was in love with, uh, uh, with Michael Gregson and uh, it was legitimate and genuine. And, um, and so, of course, his love for his daughter is what conquers all. I'm not doing my job if I don't at least ask, can you give us any tidbits at all about this, this final season that you're shooting? Well, <laughs> you will say that. Um, <laughs> and I, I was saying the other day at a, at a talk in Los Angeles that, you know, for anyone who celebrates Christmas, you know, if you said to your children on the 1st of December, would you, uh, would you like to open your presents now? The kids would all say, yes, please. And half an hour later, they'd all be crying because they know they would have spoiled their treat. Um, 
So there is so little we really can say about it. And, you know, it's a final season, so it's our last opportunity to show what happens to these people. I don't think they're all going to have definite, finite endings because people don't end until their lives are over and then we're all going to die at the end of the show. But it will be a season where our camera eventually uh, moves away from the scene and leaves Downton Abbey as it is and we'll leave it um, at, at the time we choose to leave it. Um, so I think audiences have everything to, I mean, audiences love these characters. And I think that on the ballot, there are many shows that are very respected and enjoyed, but there seems to be a, a sort of overwhelming love for this show. Uh, it's, it's really is people's pleasure. And it's all about character, like with any, with any serial drama. And in fact, when I look at the other shows in contention, you know, all the best of the other shows are all character pieces. Um, there are 20 to 25 amazing characters in this show. There's any number of people that um, Academy voters and, and audiences generally can root for and get behind. And um, I think people are going to be really excited to see where they, where they end up. Well, I've got to say, after I posted Julian's interview, and I, uh, the headline was something about, you know, Julian Fellows discusses final season of Downton Abbey or whatever, I had several <laughs> friends on my Facebook. No, they didn't know. They just, no, please don't. They can't end this. And what can you do about it? Which, of course, I can't do anything about it. Um, so I think there will be a, a, uh, a very much an enjoyment of this final season, but also a uh, lamenting of the fact that it's that, that it is leaving. I think so. I mean, it's bittersweet for those of us involved in making it. And, um, and you know, in so many ways, I'd love to go make the show for another four years. You know, we absolutely love making it. We love that audiences love it because we, we enjoy the show so much. And, and um, but I think, you know, that there is a, there is a shelf life for these shows. And, um, you know, the wrong thing is to, to think you're, you're, you're in a good place and just keep going. I think you have to, ideally, you get out while you're ahead. You get out a season or two early, which is what I think we're doing. Um, while, while, yeah, while people don't want you to leave the stage rather than people being glad to see the back of you. Um, hopefully we will produce, you know, six seasons of a, a, a great standard. And in fact, it was great to hear you say that you think season five was the best yet, because, you know, if we can, you know, keeping these, these shows in great health, you know, as they, as they become more seasoned it is, um, you know, that's a challenge and it's very satisfying if, if we can do that. I, I think you can't get enough of the show because you the more you invest in these characters, the more you enjoy their development. I mean, the, you know, we, we're seeing their children now grow up. You know, these little characters, Marigold and Sibby and George, you know, they're, they're people. And, they're, and, they're, and you have this sense of a real family that's getting older together and they feel so real. The death of Matthew was like... You know, given that that episode was aired on Christmas night in Britain, it felt like 10 million households. You know, somebody was knocking at the door with bad news at 11 p.m. on Christmas Day. Um, you know, people. Tr it's a show about a family, so people treat uh, people treat them like a family. And and um, you know, to to let go of those characters is going to be difficult for those of us who love making the show and those of us who love watching it. Well, that's why ultimately I. I think over my life, I've loved television way more than movies because you do invest in people over a long stretch of time and they do, you invite them into your home and they become part of your family. Yes, indeed. And in fact, that was exactly the, the, the pitch with, with the, what I originally made to, to Julian Fellows was, you know, Gosford Park is a, is a great film in many, many ways. It's, it's very entertaining and enjoyable and it's an absolutely pitch perfect um, depiction of that way of life, but it's a, it's a 120 minute movie and you can't, you, you don't, it is that association we have with characters that, um, you know, and, and I think as you know, as a viewer, I find it challenging sometimes because I do binge watch. It, it suits my lifestyle that I can, I can watch, you know, the, our, the other shows that we're, that we're uh, against. I can watch them very, very quickly, but you do, um, you know, you, you definitely lose that the, the few days of gestation that when we used to watch television in a more linear way, you know, that way that you could, you can watch a show for, you know, 10 weeks or whatever it might be and feel that they're kind of, these characters are percolating in your mind and, that, and that, that you're living with them and you're thinking about what you watched in the last episode and you're anticipating the next one. Um, of course, to a degree, a lot of that goes with this binge viewing and, and um, uh, you know, uh, these shows become like, you know, very long movies. Um, but there are, of course, other great advantages of binge viewing as well. 
Yeah, I, uh, as we wrap up here, I, I'm totally in agreement with you. I don't dislike binge viewing or the idea of it, but I do, because uh, I do it too. I do it all the time, but I, I, I do enjoy like something like yours where over the course of a week, you do think about, mm -hmm. I, wonder, I wonder if this means this, or I wonder if this is going to happen, or I can't wait to see, you know, and, and you, you have that, that period of time, which I've always enjoyed with television. Yes, I agree. Listen, thank you so much, Gareth. Good luck on the uh, Emmy nominations over in July and maybe a few more wins in September. And as you uh, wrap up the series here in, in production. Thank you so much. And thanks for your support.